All right, guys. Um, so I'm going to give you a lecture here on essentially the entire war um, for World War One, as far as the United States is concerned. So it's my understanding that you guys have spent a lot of time on this um, last year within the modern world history context. Um, so I just want to quickly review how the war began in Europe and then specifically focus in on the U.S.'s role in the war. Okay. So the years you see on this screen, 1914 to 1919, represent the years that this war was fought from start to finish, not necessarily the years that the United States was involved. Okay, so a really quick background, okay? Um, world War I was a war fought between two systems of alliances, okay? Um, the Allied powers, right, which include Great Britain, France, and then later Italy, as well as Russia, and of course later the United States. Um, I put Russia up here, um, but remember Ru what Russia withdraws from the war in 1917 uh, before it's over as a result of their own kind of political revolution happening there. Um, the central powers uh, are primarily kind of upheld by Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, with support from places in um, the Balkan Peninsula Balkan Peninsula like Bulgaria and Romania, okay? Um, and it should be noted that the Allied powers, with the exception of Russia, right, by this time were democratic nations, whereas the central powers, Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, reflected kind of an autocratic style government, um, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of course, kind of one of the only remaining um, imperial kind of uh, presences in Europe, right? So they had a European empire. So there are a series of long-standing trends and policies in Europe that result in this war, okay? Um, you have the massive militarization of European armies and navies after the Industrial Revolutions. Um, you have a system of deeply rooted political alliances that were formed as early as the 1870s and resulted in these entangling um, pledges uh, between European nations and peoples that if they were to involve themselves in an armed conflict, they would receive the aid of another country and so on and so forth. Um, you have a growing concern over the protection of territories abroad. So that's where the idea of imperialism comes in. Um, and then you also have this surge in nationalism of European peoples, which on the one hand destabilized large empires like the Austro-Hungarian Empire and promoted intense devotion um, it, of people to their nation at the expense of the way they viewed other nations. For example, the rivalry between Germany and Great Britain. So I've put on the end there, the powder keg, right, to represent the kind of smoking gun um, of the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Austro Empire by the Serbian Black Hand, right? This is, I call it a powder keg because it's a catalyst of the war um, that kind of puts all of these other longer standing um, factors into action. So this kind of combination of things are happening in Western Europe that uh, when this powder keg occurs, makes it ripe for war. The war itself, okay, is, a, is the first kind of modern war of its kind. It features new methods of warfare, like unrestricted submarine warfare, which was primarily used by the Germans. Um, the kind of go-to method of naval blockades by the British that were kind of used to facilitate um, the war of attrition, which is essentially uh, committing to this war and trying to wear down your opponent by blockading German ports. The British were hoping that slowly but surely Germany would be kind of squeezed out. They wouldn't have the resources necessary to continue the war. And then, of course, you have new technology, poison gas attacks, um, larger and newer kind of um, heavy machinery, um, all resulting in trench warfare, which make not only the war a total war, right, but a war of attrition as well. 
So here's just a really quick peek at kind of the system of alliances. So you have um, Bulgaria, right, and the Ottoman Empire who support Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And you see France, Great Britain, and of course, Russia. And I just want to point out, right, the reality of Germany to have to fight this war in two places on two different fronts as long as the Russians are in the war. All right. So as this is unfolding in Europe, where does the United States stand? Okay, um, first and foremost, the United States' policy in 1914 is one of neutrality. It should be noted that Wilson is president in 1914. Um, and so as Europe is descending into this all-consuming bloody conflict, uh, the United States is staying true both to Washington's advisories and his farewell address, as well as the Monroe Doctrine's clause regarding kind of neutrality when it comes to European conflicts. This is the official policy at the start of the war. However, a reality needs to be realized, right? That the United States, while trying to maintain this fight with no one, trade with everyone policy, is trading more with the Allied powers, particularly Great Britain and France. So if you look at the amount of money and economic relations that the United States has with the allied powers versus the central powers, right? It becomes clear that while the United States can, you know, survive without this modest trade to the central powers, um, a deterioration of relationships with the allied powers would be much more detrimental to the U.S. economy, okay? Um, what I don't have listed here, but what I think you should kind of make note of is the fact that Great Britain and France um, have a closer relationship with the United States in a couple of ways. Um, of course, right, the United States was a colony of Great Britain, and so there's this cultural connection that brings many Americans kind of uh, closer to Great Britain and France than, than Germany or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it's kind of this, like, Anglophilia, right? And then there's also... The common bond shared because they're all democratic nations where the nations of the central powers right are autocratic so by 1916 kind of real neutrality becomes impossible and the u.s's changing stance on the war essentially occurs after a series of events that the united states would consider to be provoking um so Starting here kind of with the beginning action of Germany, right? If you remember from last year, Germany invades Belgium even after Belgium um, declares its neutrality in the conflict to execute, execute the von Schlieffen plan, right? To kind of loop around and flank France to try to knock them out of the war really quickly. Um, and in doing so, right, Germany essentially violates what the United States would be, consider kind of rules of warfare. They invade a neutral country. So right off the bat, the United States is looking at Germany as an aggressor, right? And that is furthered by unrestricted submarine warfare. The German policy of sinking any ship um, that's heading kind of in the Atlantic to the Allied powers um, impacts U.S. trade and kills innocent people. One example of that is the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, which had American people and definitely American trade products on board. Um, this is something that the United States uh, is angry about um, with Germany. And then one year later, Germany, again, un under unrestricted submarine warfare, um, sinks the, the uh, French ship, the Sussex. Um, afterwards, and upon the United States' kind of deep disapproval, Germany signs the Sussex Pledge and says, okay, we won't do this anymore. Um, but within a year, Germany restarts the submarine warfare. And so Germany restarting the submarine warfare as kind of one of the main military strategies sends a message to the United States that our trade with the Allied powers is not going to be um, accepted by Germany, and Wilson has a big problem with that, that he should not be told who he can trade with and who he cannot um, when it comes to foreign conflicts. 
In addition to the German kind of aggression, um, we see uh, the Zimmerman note kind of controversy in February of 1917. Um, the Zimmerman telegram was a telegram from Germany to Mexico that essentially proposed a German-Mexican alliance and encouraged Mexico to wage war against the United States to, to reclaim lost territory. Um, this is a telegram that was intercepted by the British and released strategically by the British to try to get the United States to enter the war. So these things are prompting Wilson, kind of turning public opinion toward the war on behalf of the Allied powers. And then finally, you have the Russian Revolution, which happens in 1917. And if you remember the map I showed you earlier, right, the withdrawal of Russia um, means that Germany no longer has to fight a two-front war, that it can put all of the central power efforts into the Western Front uh, along France. And so this not only makes the Allied powers incredibly um, fearful, right, but it also seems to kind of increase the urgency with which this war needs to come to an end. So it's these factors, essentially, that prompt Wilson to call, ask Congress for war against Germany. Um, he does this in April of 1917, right after his re-election. And a few days later, Congress goes to war. The formal war declaration comes on April 6th. And the overall result is that almost 5 million American men, African American and white men and women are going to serve in some capacity in the war, either um, as uh, the Red Cross or in uh, reserve troops or in the Navy. Um, and 2.8 million of those are actually going to make their way over to Europe to fight the war. All right. So I've asked you guys to look at Wilson's Declaration of War. Um, you can pause this and do so now, or you can wait until after um, the lecture is completed. So a couple more things. Um, I'm going to kind of jump to the end here and just kind of point out that the primary US contribution to this war um, is, yeah, troops, but our troops were not actually the best troops. Um, they were young and poorly trained. They were utterly uneducated in the modern forms of warfare that were being practiced in Europe, but they were well supplied and they provided a real morale boost to, your, uh, to the allied troops that was needed. It's also important to understand and probably the US's biggest contribution is this continued supply of necessary war materials and resources on loan to the Allied powers. So these are things that the United States is essentially giving to the Allied powers. Okay. Um, the war comes to an end in November of 1918. Um, and it comes to, to an end in the form of an armistice. Okay. And so really quickly, an armistice is a ceasefire. It's an agreement to stop combat but in order for the war to formally come to an end, a peace treaty needs to be drafted. And that happens in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, 27 of the victorious allied nations are going to appear at the Paris Peace Conference, but four of those nations are going to essentially make all of the decisions. Okay. So, it should be noted that um, at the Paris Peace Conference, Germany and Russia were absent purposefully. They were purposefully excluded from these negotiations, um, and which left essentially the Allied powers to totally determine the terms of Germany and the Central Powers' surrender. Um, the majority of this war was fought on European soil, and especially in France. Britain and France had been embroiled in this conflict for almost five years. And the kind of the general idea is that they wanted Germany to pay. They wanted to punish Germany severely, and they wanted to kind of claim Germany's colonial powers uh, and colonial uh, outposts throughout the world. Um, Italy is also here as well. 
but I think Wilson's role in the Paris Peace Conference is what I want to focus on. Um, and, you know, Wilson comes in after, I don't know, about 18 months um, of warfare as opposed to four and a half years. Um, and he comes in with this kind of a radical idea that's known as the 14 points. And really, what the 14 points represents is Wilson's plan for a long-lasting peace. And his attitude is peace without victory. So whereas Britain and France are promoting, kind of uh, enforcing a peace treaty that will never allow Germany to regain enough power to do this again, Wilson is saying we can't punish them. We have to proceed here um, moderately so that future problems like this can be avoided. We don't want to sow the seeds of revenge or of bitterness or of severe economic depression in Germany. Um, as you can imagine, this was not loved by the rest of the allied powers at the Paris Peace Conference. So lastly, and this is the last slide, guys, um, the Treaty of Versailles is drafted, right? And so the, what the Treaty of Versailles actually is, it's a, it's a formal peace document that ends the war and determines conditions for peace moving forward, okay? The War Guilt Clause makes its way into the treaty um, at the behest of Britain and France, um, and this basically puts the blame for the entire conflict on the shoulders of Germany, uh, takes sole responsibility and sets up kind of the justification for punishing Germany with things like outrageous reparations or payments, the last of which were paid in 2010 actually, um, and which justifies ordering Germany to totally demilitarize and surrender their colonial possessions. Most of Wilson's 14 points are rejected. Um, by the Allied powers, one of the things that is actually accepted is the League of Nations, okay? Um, the League of Nations is the first kind of international organization to keep peace worldwide. So it requires nations to join, kind of like a membership, and participate in making sure that conflict around the world is curbed. Um, and the idea here is that as many nations as possible would join this. Um, and it's also worth noting that Germany was not invited to do so. So we're going to talk more in class um, about the League of Nations and the United States' important decision regarding it. Um, but for now, right, this is the general overview of the war. So make sure that you're able to answer those questions with some decent detail. Um, and make sure to take a look at that primary source that's on the sheet as well. Thanks, guys.